I'm Finbar O'Connor and I'm the librarian at Marina Library. And I'm delighted to welcome today um, Cormac Moore. He's going to be giving today's talk on Edward Carson, architect of partition in Ireland. Uh, Cormac is the author of a book, Birth of the Border, which deals with uh, Carson's involvement in this issue. So without any further ado, I'll pass you over to Cormac. Thank you, Finbar. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Edward Carson and his role with the Partition of Ireland. So if uh, I'm, I'm going to give a presentation on a, um, with a PowerPoint uh, slides. Um, so if you have any problem in viewing this presentation, please let me know um, through the chat or the Q&A button. And as Finbar said, please do um, you know, provide any comments or questions and we'll try to get to all of those at the end of my talk. With the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921, Lord Edward Carson of Doncairn gave his maiden speech to the House of Lords. Having been elevated there the previous May, claiming, what a fool I was, I was only a puppet, and so was Ulster, and so was Ireland, in the political game that was to get the Conservative Party into power. Many cite this quotation as evidence that Carson was opposed to partition and only realized when it was too late that he had been deceived all along by the Tories in dividing the island of Ireland. By reading his entire speech that day though, an extremely bitter one, even by Carson's standards, it is clear he was not criticizing the Tories for partitioning Ireland. He was criticizing them for surrendering to Sinn Féin by conceding too much to Republicans in offering dominion status. Throughout his speech, he continuously referred to Sinn Féin as a murder gang and Michael Collins as head of the murder gang. He was disgusted that Britain had abandoned Ireland at the very heart of the empire to independence, with an army, with a navy, with separate customs, with ministers at foreign courts and delegates to the League of Nations, where they can vote against you. Unlike most people who realized from early summer in 1921 that a deal needed to be done with Sinn Féin. Carson was deeply disturbed by the negotiations between the British government and Sinn Féin that followed the truce in July. He firmly believed that the IRA was about to be defeated. When the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, told Carson privately that the game is up and we shall have to give in, declaring that he therefore would resign, Carson replied, that he hoped he would not involve the Conservative members of the government, Austin Chamberlain and F.E. Smith, more commonly known as Lord Birkenhead, in the discredit of such a surrender. Carson soon discovered, however, that Lloyd George had no intention of resigning, and much worse, that a suggestion of talks with Sinn Féin had come from Chamberlain in the first place, with Birkenhead's support. Much of the venom in Carson's speech was directed against his old ally, Birkenhead, the two of them seen here inspecting an Ulster volunteer force, a UVF rally, against Home Rule in 1912. Carson continued by deploring the pressure being put on Ulster to join with the South, referencing the attempts made by the British government during the treaty negotiations to squeeze the already established Northern Parliament to become autonomous within an All-Ireland Parliament from Dublin instead of from Westminster. He stated, like everybody else, you, the British government, have betrayed Ulster. This constant preaching at Ulster is nauseating. The other evening, I saw with disgust that Mr. Austin Chamberlain, the son of Mr. Joseph Chamberlain, who was a huge a hero of Ulster Unionists, have, having agreed to put Ulster into these terms. Then said he made, he made an appeal to the comradeship of his old friend, Sir James Craig, the Northern Ireland Prime Minister, to come in and submit to the domination of Sinn Féin. I could not help thinking that it was very like, after having shot a man in the back, going over to him and patting him on the shoulder and saying, old man, die as quickly as you can and do not make any noise. For the last three to six months, the whole vitriolic power of the press, inspired by number 10 Downing Street and their able propaganda department, have been carrying on week after week and day after day, a campaign of falsehood and misrepresentation against Ulster, bellowing, bullying and blustering as if Ulster cared one farting about it. But why is all this attack made upon Ulster? What has Ulster done? I'll tell you what Ulster has done. She has stuck too well to you, and you believe that because she is loyal, 
you can kick her as you like. He claimed he only accepted the Government of Ireland Act 1920 and the partitioning of Ireland once he had the most solemn assurances from the Prime Minister that that was to be a settlement of the case and a permanent one, so that Ulster might proceed after being threatened for 30 years to the natural development of our resources and to the progress of the great democratic community over which she presides. He concluded by saying to my Ulster friends, and I say it with all sincerity and solemnity, do not be led into any, any such false line. Stick to your old ideals of closer and closer connection with this country. The coalition government, after all, is not the British nation, and the British nation will certainly see you right it. Your interests lie with Great Britain. You have helped her and you have helped her empire and her empire belongs just as much to you as it does to England. Stick to it and trust the British people. I have quoted at length from this speech as it has, as with many other speeches and actions by Carson, been open to many different and contradictory interpretations that ignore the many complexities that made up Carson the man. Partition was for Carson, a Southern Unionist from Dublin an extremely complex issue, and one he struggled with throughout his political career. The guiding star of his political life was to keep Ireland united within the British Empire, and yet he was arguably the person most responsible for Ireland's division. It is important not to read too much into many of Carson's utterances. As he admitted himself to a Tory backbencher in 1913, a lot of it was play acting. Using his considerable skills in cross-examination -exam and make belief that had earned him such a fearsome reputation in the courthouses of Ireland and England, Carson adopted highly theatrical performances in his political campaign to oppose home rule. Edward Carson was born on 4, on four Harcourt Street in Dublin in 1854, second son among six children of Edward Henry Carson, an architect and civil engineer, and Isabella Carson, Neil Lambert. While a Southern Irish Unionist who was rooted in the Dublin Protestant middle and professional classes, he was somewhat removed from the wealthy landed and commercial dynasties that led Southern Unionism. His main links with the landed gentry was through his mother's family, the Lamberts of County Galway. On his father's side, the Carstens of Dublin, there was no such pretensions to such grandeur. Edward's first wife, Annette Kerwin, was a daughter of a retired county inspector of the Royal Irish Constabulary, who was considered to be at sea in the Metropolitan High Society, where she and Carson found themselves by the late 1890s. Carson was educated at a day school in Harcourt Street and at a small public school, Arlington House, in Port Arlington in County Leash. Here are the rooms of Arlington House. He then enrolled in Trinity College Dublin before qualifying as a barrister at the King's Inns in 1877. Although Carson began his career defending farmers and tenants, it was not long before he switched sides to appear for landed clients and the Crown. He soon caught the attention of Arthur Balfour, the Chief Secretary for Ireland from 1887 to 1891. It was under Balfour's mentoring and patronage that Carson's star rose quickly and he was appointed Solicitor General for Ireland and proposed and elected as MP for Trinity College Dublin. Even though Carson became the symbol of Ulster's opposition to home rule from the 1910s. He remained as MP for Trinity College Dublin until 1918, when he was elected to the constituency of Belfast, Don Cairn. While Balfour was nicknamed Bloody Balfour for his ruthless enforcement of prime acts, Carson was nicknamed Coercion Carson. And here's a cartoon from Punch in 1894 of Banshee Carson opposing the evicted tenants bill. In the late 19th century, Carson was seen as a champion of unionist and conservative values, but also demonstrated an independent streak, which is prominent throughout his political career. He was prepared to oppose his mentor, Balfour, who introduced measures that liberalised Irish land laws, as well as his brother, Gerard Balfour, who also served as Chief Secretary of Ireland. These divisions over land saw Carson ferociously oppose his own conservative front bench and left a legacy of resentment with some of his closest political allies. Balfour commented on Carson's bitter tongue to Queen Victoria. Soon after Carson entered Parliament in 1892, the second Home Rule Bill was defeated by the House of Lords in 1893. Although Ulster did not play as prominent a role 
as it would during the third home rule crisis 20 years later, Carson realized in, given the concentration of the unionists based in the province, that the unionist case against home rule hinged on Ulster. And here is Carson accompanying the leader of the opposition, the Marquis of Salisbury, on the latter's visit to Ulster, posing home rule in 1893. Carson is standing in the centre, directly behind Salisbury. This is one of the first occasions Carson had been to Ulster. While Carson spent most of the first half of his life in Dublin, he spent the vast bulk of the second half of it in England. He moved his legal practice to London in 1893, shortly after he became an MP, where his legal reputation soared, becoming involved in some of the most celebrated trials of the late Victorian and Edwardian periods. His involvement in the defending the Marquis of Queensbury, the first of the trials that resulted in Os Oscar Wilde's imprisonment, is most familiar to Irish audiences, but he was also involved in many more trials that received just as much attention with English audiences. Considered as a potential leader of the British Conservative Party, Carson instead became chairman of the Irish Unionist Parliamentary Party in February 1910, succeeding Walter Long. In effect, he became the leader of Irish unionism and within a short period of time, exclusively the leader of Ulster unionism. In many ways, it was strange for Carson, who had almost no connections with Ulster, to become the leader of Ulster unionism, but it reveals the lack of options available at the time. The only other preeminent person within the Ulster movement then was James Craig, who actually recommended and sought for Carson to become chairman. Both together became the two towering figures in Ulster Unionism's opposition to home rule and the two men most responsible for the establishment of Northern Ireland. Craig's pragmatic and administrative skills complemented Carson's charisma and power of oratory. Craig's biographer, St. John Irvine, claimed, effective apart, they were irresistible together. Carson himself admitted it was James Craig who did most of the work and I got most of the credit. While it is important to remember that much of Carson's rhetoric was theatrical and play acting. There was a consistency to his militancy from the moment he led Ulster Unionism to his resignation over 10 years later. He told Craig in July 1911 that he was not for a mere game of bluff and unless men are prepared to make great sacrifices, which they clearly understand, the talk of resistance is no use. The first major sign of this resistance to home rule came months later in September 1911 at Craig's house, Craig Avon. When Carson was introduced to a huge crowd of loyalists, where it was resolved that under no conditions would they acknowledge any home rule government, and a commission was appointed to frame a provisional government for Ulster. Here is Punch satirizing Carson as a Native American beginning a war dance for a war that was two years away. Carson also claimed in 1911 that home rule would be resisted by force, a harbinger of things to come. The treasonous language and rhetoric of Carson and others within Ulster Unionism increased significantly in 1912 when the Third Home Rule Bill was introduced by the British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith to the House of Commons. Home rule was looking more like a reality. Even though violence was threatened, the main thrust of the opposition to home rule in 1912 was through demonstrations and rallies. The largest and most symbolic opposition to home rule came on Ulster Day. 28 of September 1912, when just under 250,000 men signed the Solomon League and Covenant, and just under 250,000 women signed an equivalent declaration, pledging to use all means which may be found necessary to defeat the present conspiracy to set up a Home Rule Parliament in Ireland. And here are some images from uh, Ulster Day, including one of Carson signing, being the first to sign the Covenant in Belfast City Hall. And here's a cartoon from Punch describing or uh, uh, showing Carson as an heroic Napoleon mounted on Marengo, declaring Ulster will write. The pen for the moment is mightier than the sword. Carson was allowed to stretch and even break boundaries in the type of violent language he used because of the support he and Ulster Unionists received from the Conservative Party. The Liberal Party was a far more lukewarm ally for the Irish Party that the Conservative Party was for Ulster Unionists. The Liberal Party leader and British Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, was as described by Ronan Fanning, an unwilling ally 
a resentful partner in the loveless marriage with John Redmond's Irish party. On the other hand, the new Conservative Party leader since 1911, Andrew Bonner Law, whose father was born in Coleraine in Derry, was considered an orange fanatic, who declared at a large unionist rally attended by Carson at Blenheim Palace in July 1912, that if home rule was imposed in Ulster, he could imagine no length of resistance Ulster would go to in which, in which I should not be prepared to support him. And here is Bonner Law with Carson on their way to an anti-home rule rally in April 1912. Alvin Jackson contends that it was not just that Boner Law steadfastly supported the Carsonite cause in these years, despite being the national leader of Toryism and Unionism, he was in some ways the junior partner in his relationship with Carson and certainly acted occasionally as if this were the case. Ulster Unionists were allowed to commit treasonous acts and arm themselves on punish with the explicit support of the Conservative Party and the implicit acquiescence of the Liberal government. Despite all of the demonstrations and rallies to prevent home rule from coming into effect, by the end of 1912, it appeared to be li making little imprint on the passage of the Home Rule Bill through Parliament. Both the Liberal Party and the Irish Party saw much of the rhetoric as bluff. Here's a cartoon from the Dublin-based Leprechaun Cartoon Mon Monthly, mocking Carson and earned bluster. Even Carson's amendment in January 1913 to exclude the nine counties of Ulster from home rule was not taken seriously. In 1913, Ulster Unionist opposition to home rule increased its militancy and front and center was Carson in bringing this about. From the moment he became effective leader of Ulster Unionism, he was portrayed as a straight talker who embodied militant convictions in his letters and in his speeches. He completely abandoned his commitment to constitutionalism by sanctioning the formation of the UVF in January 1913. And here is a, a huge crowd of 12,000 UVF members who were inspected by Carson in Belfast in September 1913. In January 1914, it was Carson who inaugurated the gun running episode, which resulted in the landing of arms and ammunition at Larne, Bangor and Donadee on the night early morning of 24, 25th of April, 1914. Here are some uh, images of those uh, of illustrations of, of the events that night, which you can find in Illustrated London News. It was Carson who gave Colonel Fred Crawford the green light to import the weapons from Germany. Crawford compared Carson to the biblical King David. My soul was knit to his, even as Jonathan's was to David. And I loved him as a leader and as a man. Carson was also instr instrumental in the founding of a provisional government for Ulster during the Third Home Rule Crisis. And here is Carson addressing a meeting of the provisional government of Ulster in Ulster Hall in July 1914. Behind him is what was described as the largest union jack in the whole of the United Kingdom. In his speech, while Carson claimed they were still willing to consider any such proposals for a settlement, he declared that the time for words was over and the time for action had arrived and that they were compelled to press on with the completion of our arrangements, to resist by every means in our power, every attempt which may be made to impose the authority of any home rule parliament on Ulster. There is no doubt that much of Carson's performances at this time could be described as play acting from the accomplished courtroom performer who also knew the British Liberal government was in a bind over Ulster. This granted Carson great latitude to push boundaries it is also true that Carson met with fierce opposition for some of his more moderate proposals within Ulster Unionism. But his speeches, and more importantly, his actions in bringing back the gun to Irish politics, of course brought the strong possibility of civil war on the horizon, and it certainly escalated the divisions within Ireland. Carson has to be considered culpable for the militancy that he ultimately promoted and encouraged, and there can be little doubt that this Ulster Unionist militancy was a key factor in the partitioning of Ireland. As the Home Rule crisis continued, Carson's stance on the partition of some or all of Ulster, as was the case with many Ulster Unionists, evolved from a tactic to a compromise. Partition was no longer the means, but the actual end in itself. His patron, Arthur Balfour, believed the separation of Ulster from Ireland may be the least calamitous of all the calamitous courses open to us. Whilst Carson often made contradictory remarks in private on partition, again his public stance and ultimately his actions demonstrated that he supported the permanent exclusion 
of six counties of Ulster from at least 1913. Here's a leprechaun cartoon of Aaron versus Bull in the divorce courts with Carson pleading, if there is to be a separation, which I must deplore, I insist on Mr. Bull be granted the custody of the boy Ulster. This change in stance was in many ways borne by Carson's frustration with Southern Unionists, who he felt were not mobilizing in opposition to home rule in the same way they had during the Home Rule Bills of 1886 and 1893. On Southern Unionists being unwilling to publicly support Ulster Unionists for fear of the effects it would have on their businesses, Carson told Boner Law, if this really represents the position, it seems to me obvious that we are not justified in risking civil war for the likes of people who will take no risks, even of a financial kind, for themselves. And I do think it shows clearly that they have become more or less reconciled to the idea of home rule. As Ireland spiralled toward civil war, Asquith negotiated with Carson and Redmond to compromise on Ulster. Here's a cartoon from Punch in 1914, suggesting for Carson and Redmond to meet to reach a compromise solution. Carson rejected Redmond's suggestion of Ulster being granted home rule within an Irish home rule parliament. He scorned Lloyd George's scheme for Ulster counties being allowed to opt out temporarily from home rule famously saying he did not want a sentence of death to a stay of execution for six years. He told Walter Long, I believe that they intend to put a time limit and didn't compel Ulster to come in automatically. For my own part, I am not inclined to have anything to do with it. At the Buckingham Palace Conference, organised by King George V in July 1914, Carson insisted on the permanent exclusion of six counties of Ulster from Home Rule. It has been suggested that Carson was a prisoner of the more extreme followers within Ulster Unionism, who were apparently afraid that a big entire Ulster would gravitate towards United Ireland. Carson still was a Unionist who pushed for a six county solution more than anyone. Given Carson's fierce independence and willingness to break ranks with his conservative allies and friends, to me it seems implausible that Carson was ever a prisoner to anyone. It just does not appear to be part of his nature. He broke ranks with his mentor, Balfour and many other Tories over the 1903 Wyndham Land Act. He resigned as Attorney General of the wartime cabinet in October 1915 and effectively led the opposition thereafter until he was reappointed to the cabinet once David Lloyd George became Prime Minister in December 1916. He again resigned in January 1918, demonstrating his independence and his conditional loyalty. Instead of being a prisoner, it appears that he personally believed that six counties of Ulster should be permanently excluded from the Home Rule and did not need any prompting from the more extreme followers within Ulster Unionism. With Lloyd George's efforts in July 1916 to reach a deal between Carson and Redmond on Ireland, although in pain and depressed by his abandonment of Unionists in the Ulster counties of Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan, Carson was unyielding in insisting that six and not the nine counties of Ulster be permanently excluded from home rule. According to Jackson, Carson's unambiguous advocacy of a six county partition scheme in 1916, in the context of the Lloyd George negotiations, consolidated the tensions between him and the Saunderson family from Cabin and brought an open split with Edward Saunderson's eldest son, Somerset, as well as with many other unionists in the three outlying counties in Ulster. The betrayal felt was particularly acute as many from Monaghan, Cavan, and Donegal had died fighting for the 36th Ulster Division at the Battle of the Somme just weeks earlier. Once the First World War ended, Carson played less of a central role in British and even Irish political affairs, retreating into more comfortable territory, focusing on his legal career. He still championed the exclusion of the six northeastern counties at every given opportunity. And pictured as Carson speaking during the 12th of July demonstration in 1919, much of Carson's bellicose rhetoric may have been play acting to him, but his, often, his, his words often led to more deadly consequences. His confrontational language and his threat of the use of force by Ulster Unionism to oppose home rule brought Ireland to the very brink of civil war. After the First World War, his speeches still inflamed tensions and offered little in the way of compromise to try and bring the two main communities together. He of course cannot be solely blamed for such division, post First World War, War Ireland was no place for nuance. His 1920 12th of July speech to 25,000 Orangemen at a field in Finnehy in the outskirts of Belfast stands out as being particularly inflammable. 
we're in talking about the invasion of Sinn Féin to Ulster and the reorganization of the dormant UVF, Carson stated, we must proclaim today clearly that come what will, be the consequences what they may, we in Ulster will tolerate no Sinn Féin, no Sinn Féin organization, no Sinn Féin edits. And these are not mere words. I hate words without action. Days later, the sectarian violence, which defined the birth of Northern Ireland, started in Belfast, lasting for two years, with the loss of just under 500 lives in the city. Carson's thinly veiled threat to use arms has to be considered a contributory factor to the outbreak of that violence. The London Times blamed Carson for having sown the dragon's teeth in Ireland. It is important to note that while Carson failed to transcend the sectarian divisions within Irish politics, unlike many of his Ulster Unionist colleagues, he was not an Orange Zealot. He supported the establishment of a Catholic university in Ireland, and he regularly defied Orange Order conventions of attending funerals of Catholic friends and colleagues, including John Redmond's funeral in 1918. With the introduction of the Government of Ireland Bill, which offered a devolved parliament for the new entity of Northern Ireland, Carson complained bitterly to the British government that where Ulster Unionists wanted to stay with you and where you had no cause of complaint against him, you still want to kick them out as if they were of no use to please somebody else. Carson, like many other Ulster Unionists, wanted the excluded counties to remain fully within Westminster. He still, still conceded an Ulster Parliament had attractions. Once it is granted, it cannot be interfered with. You cannot knock parliaments up and down as you do a ball. And once you have planted them there, you cannot get rid of them. He did not oppose the passage of the bill through the House of Commons and Lords, which paved the way for the partition of Ireland. The picture is Carson arriving at the Ulster Unionist Council meeting in March 1920, which ratified the decision to have six counties included in the Northern Parliament and not the nine counties of Ulster as originally planned by the British government much to the disgust of the Unionists of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. Much has been made of Carson's decision to stand down as Ulster Unionist leader in February 1921, resulting in him not becoming the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, or of his absence at the state opening of the Northern Parliament with King George V in June 1921, as signs of his opposition to partition. Newspapers like the Sunday Independent and Freeman's Journal, as shown here, were quick to mock Carson for abandoning what they felt would be a failure, Northern Ireland. However, in resigning as leader, he claimed the only reason he was doing so was because of his age and energy. He turned 67 in February 1921, and he would not be able to work from morning till night, all day and every day, which was required of the new prime minister. In asserting that he was as enthusiastic about our cause as I ever was, he stated, you have got your own parliament to govern yourselves but having got it, you must keep it. Carson stood down as leader only when a Northern Parliament was secured. Carson was a notorious hypochondriac, always fretting over his health. A pattern emerged in Carson's life, particularly during the war years, of bursts of intense activity, followed by long bouts of disappearance, silence and recuperation. These dramatic breakdowns in health, in health would have been more difficult to hide or even contemplate as Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. Though never known for his humility, Carson possibly was also aware and conscious of his relatively modest record in ministerial office. While his legal background, so with his legal background, while an effective and ferocious opponent in opposition, he was hesitant and cautious as a cabinet minister. His temperament was not suitable for government. He did not attend the official opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, but sent his wife Ruby in his stead. And here is Ruby standing between Irish Chief Secretary Hammer Greenwood and James Craig. Ruby was his second wife, who he married in September 1914, months after his first wife, Annette, died in April of that year. Carson wrote the Boner Law at the time of the establishment of Northern Ireland. It would take a very brave man to take away Ulster's Parliament. On his securing of the six counties, he wrote to his friend, F.S. Oliver, I think I've left the Northern Ireland Parliament in an impregnable security having regard to the results of the May elections. And the infant must now grow and in its expansion, try to show what the South and West might well imitate. As mentioned at the start of this talk, he opposed the Anglo-Irish Treaty, not because of its role in partitioning Ireland, but for the pressure put on Craig and the Northern government to succumb to an all Ireland parliament and for what Carson saw as a surrender to the murder gang of Sinn Féin. He was one of very few people that held a conviction in June, 1921 that the war was going well for the crown in Ireland, 
stating things are not going to the dogs, we are going to the top. Even though he was opposed to the treaty, Carson offered to act as Northern Ireland's commissioner on the Boundary Commission, saying a little modification of the boundary might be advantageous. In later years, Carson confided to Oliver, but I feel I am a citizen without nationality or anything to be loyal to. He still asked Craig that he would like to be laid to rest in Ulster. Although he never lived in Northern Ireland, he and his wife were frequent visitors there after 1921, up until his death in 1935. Here he is laying the first sod for the Belfast water scheme in the Silent Valley in the Moor Mountains in 1923. And picture this Carson McCraig, also in 1923, visiting the site of the new Parliament buildings at Stormont Castle. And here is Carson again with his wife, a big smiling Carson, arriving at Stormont again, this time in 1928, for the laying of the foundation stone of the Parliament buildings. He arrived in Belfast for the opening of the Parliament buildings at Stormont in 1932, on board a ship, the Ulster Monarch. The man known as King Carson to his Ulster followers made his last visit to Northern Ireland a year later to witness the unveiling of the bronze statue of himself on a high granite pedestal in front of the Stormont Parliament buildings. The loyalists of Northern Ireland had commissioned a sculptor, L.S. Merrifield, to cast a 14-foot statue of Carson with an inscription on the base which read, by the loyalists of Ulster as an expression of their love and admiration for its subject. In the presence of more than 40,000 people, Carson, overcome with emotion, said, I know of no words to express my gratitude to great people who all through these years never for one moment deceived or deserted me. When he died in 1935, he was given a state funeral by the Northern government. And here are some uh, images from Carson's funeral. He was buried at St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. He's the only person to be buried in the cathedral. And here is his grave being prepared at St. Anne's Cathedral. As his coffin was lowered into the tomb, soil from each of the six counties was scattered on it. The tomb is railed in bronze and marked by a granite stone from the Moor Mountains, bearing the one word, Carson. To conclude, it is clear that Edward Carson desired for all of Ireland to remain within the Union. But when this was no longer a realistic option, he committed himself wholeheartedly to the exclusion of the North East from Home Rule. By cutting through his bombastic rhetoric and his many contradictory and ambiguous remarks, and by looking at his actions as the leader of Ulster Unionism when Ireland was divided, Sir Edward Carson has to be considered as the architect of the partition of Ireland. So thank you for your time, so I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Cormac. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, there's a QA and a app at the bottom of the screen there. Um, I'll just see what's there at the moment. Um, so we have a question from Richard A. Wolf. Uh, is it true that Carson spoke Irish? My source is a BBC webpage. Um, I, I don't see much evidence of it, to be honest. I know he was a he knew Douglas Hyde, who obviously was the founder and first president of the Gaelic League. Um, when and like they were, they were kind of uh, similar backgrounds, and he had some dealings with him. But uh, I, I'm not aware if he spoke Irish. I haven't seen much evidence of it, to be honest. With you. He wasn't, as I said in my in my talks, well, he certainly wasn't anti-Irish, like, like some maybe other other unions were. In terms of he he supported a Catholic university. He, you know, he used to go to Catholic funerals. Um, so I, there, there certainly wasn't that kind of a that huge sectarian element with him that there would have been with, with some other Ulster unionists. Okay, we have a question from Helen Sheil. Uh, what about the nineteen eighteen election? Did that not in effect show the partition of Ireland? Well, certainly, um, nineteen eighteen, the results. Um, showed obviously if you compare Ulster to or, or uh, the rest of Ireland yet yeah, there, there was a clear uh, um, preference for um, Ulster Unionist candidates um, but e even in 19 this has all changed very quickly as well like 1912 1913 there was actually uh, more um, Irish party um, um, MPs in, in the whole province of Ulster than there was in Ulster Unionist so it was a bit it was a bit fluid there was also a pact between Sinn Féin and the Irish party in the election that was kind of uh, brokered by the Catholic Church that didn't run as smoothly as, as it could have um, even the 1921 election, um, the, the pact between Sinn Féin and, and uh, 
the United Irish League didn't run as smoothly as it could have. Um, but but of course, yeah, if you were to take six counties, you know, the reason why six counties was chosen as a uh, as, as the place to be Northern Ireland was because two thirds of the people there were Unionists and, and one third were Catholics. That's why the six counties were chosen. Um, but obviously that is problematic for you know in terms of why that the particular area was chosen. Why why was six counties chosen? Um, when two of those counties in particular, Tyrone and Manor, had majority Catholics and, and and consistently elected nationalists over over uh, over unionists. Okay, and we have a question from Gareth Harmon. Could you speak a little more about Carson's relationship with Southern Unionists in the context of the 1917 Irish Convention? Well, yeah, there was there was definitely a rift. It was it was pretty much terminal um, between Ulster Unionists and Southern Unionists by 1917. Um, like Carson had suggested, you know that that yeah, he obviously wanted the exclusion of uh, of Ulster parts of Ulster from um, Home Rule, um, but he, he did he did consider kind of all Ireland functions, which which uh, actually took the guise of this is in 1917 when the convention was convening and actually before it convened, he, he was talking about that kind of council of ireland um idea of uh, you know have, having all ireland kind of uh, um options available um you know and that, that both kind of uh, um, bodies would, would uh, work towards uh, at this stage we're, we're still talking about ulster being in, in westminster uh or six counties of ulster being in westminster and the rest of ireland have its own home rule um, Parliament. Um, but the Ulster Unionists, including Carson, didn't play much role in the Irish Convention. They didn't give it much of a chance. Um, Southern Unionists, that's where they kind of start to uh, ally themselves with Redmond and the Irish Party and, and try to reach a compromise rule, so would, which would have given um, Home Rule very, very limited powers, a lot less powers than, than were offered under the 1912 Home Rule Bill and then the, the 1919 uh, Government of Ireland Bill. Um, uh, but it, it, because the Ulster Unionists, you know, didn't take part at all, really, they, they were there in body, but not in spirit, um, it, it was always going to fail. Thanks. And we've got a, just a comment from Kira Draper. Many thanks for this really, for me, enlightening presentation. I'm sure it was enlightening for a lot of us. Uh, we've got Deirdre McNahuna. Could you elaborate on your point on Carson's militancy? Yeah, well, I, 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 if you look at these, all of his speeches, particularly in that kind of when he became the effective leader of Ulster Unionism in 1910, uh, up up until before the war, and even even after the war as well, like you know, um, when when the rise of Sinn Fein and, and the IRA's campaign, um, a lot of the language he was using was very militant. Um, you know, he was saying, you know, we will fight. You know, and he obviously raised an army in the, in the, in the UVF, which which became known as Carson's Army. Um, um, you know, he, he, this is treason. Like he was basically, he was the himself and the Conservative Party were were prepared to um, fight to prevent uh, a law from His Majesty's government coming into effect, um, and that's what they were prepared to do. And they kept on talking about it. And, and Carson was the leader of that militancy. So not only did he talk a lot about it, he also um, was responsible for uh, forming the UVF and also um, getting arms from Germany in in April of 1914. Um, so you know, there's, there's no question that. Uh, this um, um, raised tensions um, and throughout this period. After after the First World War, you know he he you know he was uh, instrumental in making sure that the, the dormant UVF was uh, um, um, reinvigorated and uh, and you know armed again. Um, and and he made obviously many speeches which were considered militant um, against the rise of Sinn Fein in 1919 1920. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Kathleen or Caitlin. Uh, thanks so much for such an interesting talk. Why do you think that Carson's comments have been taken out of context and he has been suggested to be against partition? Well, I suppose it is good. it's an interesting point. Um, I think because he's from Dublin and, and look, he was an All-Ireland Unionist. Um, but but so pretty much every unionist would always claim that they were All-Ireland Unionists. Um, you know, even, even members of the Northern Government um, in the Northern Ireland government in the early 20s were talking about we wish that we were all together, um, you know, under obviously Ireland under the empire. So this was what, what Carson was suggesting wasn't, uh, you know, unusual to him or particular to him. Um, he wanted an all Ireland parliament, absolutely. But he was the one who, once he realised that wasn't going to happen, that, you know, just that the way things had evolved from the 1910s onward, that wasn't going to happen. Our, our best bet is to get as many counties as we can excluded from from Ulster, sorry, from from Ireland, uh, from Home Rule, um, within Ulster, um, and, and that speech I, I quoted at the start. To me, that's always the one that people use. That oh, he was 
talking about the government, sorry, the Conservative Party were you know, using him, using Ireland, using Ulster to get into power as an anti-partition stance. But if you read a whole speech, like he, there's no such element of that that was actually shown he was anti-partition. He was just disgusted that the British government did a deal with Sinn Féin, the murder gang, and that they were also pressurising the Northern government to be an all be part of an all learned parliament. So that shows actually he was pro-partition, that speech, instead of being anti-partition. So it's just amazing the way it's just developed over the years that because he was an all Ireland unionist originally, and he, he still harboured uh, hopes of that, that people say he wasn't against partition. And he, he did say contradictory remarks, though. He did say, I, I don't have a country anymore. But he also said, I want to be laid to rest in Ulster. And he was laid to rest in Ulster. So, you know, I, I think... Uh, it's like with David Lloyd George. Some people just use some quotes or some speech he gave as, as his beliefs. But anyone that knows Lloyd George well knows he didn't have many personal beliefs. He was uh, very loose with his morals and uh, he used to change and chop. And uh, you could find another speech that would, be, would have been completely contradictory to one he'd given. And you can find a lot with Alan Carson as well. He says one thing and then he says he committed opposite another time. So you, you just have to look at his actions, I think, um, more so than a lot of his, in his, his speeches. And, but he was consistent in his militancy over Ulster and in ex permanent exclusion of six counties of Ulster. I, I, I don't see much evidence of him diverting from that. Okay, uh, Alan, thanks you for a tour de force on Carson. And Gabriel Fagan asks, could you explain how a movement to oppose home rule led in the end to home rule in Ulster? Yeah, well, uh, this was more, more uh, Walter Long. He was the, the main kind of, uh, um, 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 he was the person who, uh, the British cabinet minister who to, uh, um, took over the committee to come up with the fourth Home Rule Bill, which became the Government of Ireland Act 1920, which, which literally led to Home Rule of uh, Ulster. Now, Ulster unions at the time, they, they didn't want that. Um, but soon after they find that like Charles Craig's brother, brother, or sorry, James Craig's brother, Charles, who was a, an MP in Westminster, he actually realised, actually, this is actually better for us, you know, because you know, there will be times where there are governments in Britain who won't support us, like Labour, we're getting close to power, the Liberals might be back in power again. Um, it'd be better actually having our own uh, parliament so we can actually essentially do what they want, and which is what happened. Um, but at the time, yeah, they, they didn't. It, it was quite ironic that actually the first home rule parliament in Ireland was in Ulster and not in the rest of Ireland um, because there was such opposition to home rule. Um, but it was, it's also part of kind of a, a, a federalist approach that Walter Long would have supported. Um, you know, this, this had been tied with for many people um, throughout the 1910s within, within British political circles of having kind of a federal scheme um, within the, the wide UK. So having parliaments in Ulster and Dublin and in London and Edinburgh, Cardiff and so on. Um, th these were all kind of, um, in, you know, looked looked upon by, by certain people. Um, and it was also a way of kind of extending kind of the, the empire's power and and lifespan, I suppose, um, by giving dominions kind of more, kind of uh, more autonomy, more, more devolution. So that's where the whole home rule for Ulster comes in. Um, uh, and actually, an Ulster unionist accepted reluctantly in the end, but they soon realised actually, this is actually good for us. Okay, hey, um, we have a question from Donald Denham. Uh, what did Carson make of Dev and of Collins, and what did they feel about him? Well, I, I don't, I don't see a huge, but we know that uh, just from that speech alone in the House of uh, Lords, that Carson gave, he, he, he considered Collins a murderer, a criminal, and leader of the murder gang. So you know he didn't have much time for him, um, and, and he would look. He, he, Carson did not have any time for Sinn Féin. Like. If we, if we look at British government policy, um, you know, particularly say from you know the War of Independence up until the truce, you had the Hawks and the Doves um, and how to deal with Sinn Féin. Um, you know, the Hawks um, like Churchill, Birkenhead, Lloyd George originally, they were all for hammering Sinn Féin and you know routing them um, um, in the war. And uh, and then they have the Doves, a lot of them in Dublin Castle, a lot of them part of the, the, the Liberal Party, who believe, look, let's let's try and get a settlement here. You know, this this war is not doing us any good. And as as it moves into 1921, particularly by spring and summer, like you see a lot of more of the hawks become doves, and they realise actually, you know, we we have to reach a settlement in vain. Carson never wavered. He didn't want anything to do with in vain. He he consistently said they were criminals, even though you could you could argue that what what they were doing was was something that he had threatened to do in, in 1912 to 14. Um, um, but he didn't have much time for them. Um, there was actually some good correspondence between the judge, James O'Connor, um, in um, early 1921. James O'Connor met with Carson and father, um, uh, Michael Flanagan, the Sinn Féin vice president uh, um, and priest. He, he, um, he, he met with Carson in Carson's home in London. And, and they, were, they were talking about a settlement. Um, um, so Car Carson was, was open to 
to talk to some Sinn Féin members. He obviously met with Father Michael Flanagan, he, but he insisted that you know, six counties have to be kind of left uh, um, alone. Um, and De, De Valera said Carson was key. Actually, De Valera believing all of us that um, this, this was an English policy, you know, it wasn't anything to do with Ulster Unionists really, quite naive, that's what he believed. But he, after the meeting he had with Craig in May 1921, he said there was no point in meeting Craig again because you know he's he's not the root of the problem here. We need to get through England. It's, it's England's decisions. Carson knows that, but but Carson's not going to change his mind, and I won't be able to change Carson's mind. Okay, and we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Did Carson go to the same school as Oscar Wilde? They, they went to college together, kind of Trinity. But they weren't the same school. Carson was homeschooled, and then he went to Arlington House in Port Arlington, um, a very small school. But no, not, he was with uh, Wild in Trinity. And I think Wild was actually at the time of the trial said they were friends, but uh, Carson's kind of a, they were acquaintances more than friends. <laughs> uh, Dr. Beebe asks, if he was agreeable to six counties as early as 1913, did he ever seek to console unionists in Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal between 1913 and 1921? Well, not really. Like he, he obviously said he was in great pain and he was, uh, you know, anguished by abandoning unionist there but he stuck to his guns on that and uh um and, and we have to remember like you know I mean, the some league and covenant was signed this is an all ulster kind of movement and there was many who signed from cavan mon and donegal uh, and and uh and a lot of a lot of the kind of uh the talk around six counties was behind closed doors um you know kind of before the war a lot of the time it, it kind of started coming out in the open really by the, the time of the buckingham palace conference in, in july 1914 but it, it really comes out in the open in 1916 in like George negotiates with uh, which uh, uh, Carson Redmond separately. And that's when that's when and, and he actually has to get the support of the Ulster Unionist Council. Um, that's when it, it, it those kind of frigid breakouts and become almost terminal. And it by 1920 when the Ulster Unionist Council ratified because the the as I said in my talk, um, Walter Long's committee suggested for all of the nine counties of Ulster to be in the Northern Ireland Parliament. And but uh, unions rejected that because it was too close to the bone in terms of majority of Catholics, um, or sorry, majority of Protestants over Catholics, um, and and that's when you know the the it became terminal and pretty much the relationship which between uh, um, unionists and uh, sorry the, the three counties unions of three counties and, and Carson and other Ulster unions. Okay, so we still have a lot of questions coming in. Are you happy to keep going? Happy uh, for the moment. Um, so the next one is uh, Derek Bell. Did nationalist attitudes to unions contribute to partition? Yeah, like, this, this wasn't that, you know, uh, one side was totally in the wrong and the, and the other side was uh, uh, glorious and, and correct and everything they did. I think, I think it's often too simplistic mm -hmm. when we look at partition that it, it, it just is Ulster unionists versus Irish nationalists. Like it's a lot more complicated than that. There was actually opposition within unionism to um, 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 partition or even, you know, <coughs> Some, some Ulster unionists, can, you know, conceded that there should be home rule um, for all of Ireland, um, and obviously the Southern unionists, um, you know, were, were kind of open to that concept by certainly after the war. Um, and within nationalism as well, like there, there was obviously there was there was just this ignorance really of, of what true uh, unionist feelings were, and actually just particularly if you look at Sinn Fein, who just didn't they didn't have enough people on the ground at the time they became the the voice of Irish nationalism, and. They, uh, you know, they just didn't un understand the Ulster mind really, and they they always felt, as I said, with England's problem, you know, they, once they leave, Ulster unionists will come into United Ireland, which was which was always uh, wishful thinking. Um, so they didn't have a right correct policy on how to deal with Ulster unionists from the start. Uh, but also we have to look at Redmond and and Devlin and Dillon for the Irish Party. They made huge mistakes as well. They and, and Devlin said it himself, like we've been compromising the whole time since. You know, for, essentially since 1913, and we've got nothing in return. There was no clear strategy either of, of where this is going to go. Like John Redmond seemed to see the prize, and he kept on compromising, compromising, but it, it didn't change anything. Though it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, bring any uh, any closer to a solution. Devlin himself, Joseph Devlin, who who knew was a Belfast man, extremely popular in West Belfast, he said, "For all of the compromising and the you know the talks we we're doing, where is the goddess? All we've done is lost our supporters and got no closer to an agreement." So of course, nationalists uh, um, um, didn't handle this period well either. So uh, from an anonymous attendee, they say they're from Monaghan and Ulster and Ulster and Northern Ireland being used interchangeably and slogans like Ulster says no have always annoyed me because it lumps all nine counties together. 
ignoring that Cavan Monaghan or Donegal aren't in Northern Ireland. Do you know of any accounts of people from these three counties criticising this use of Ulster? Well, it wasn't just <clears throat> three counties. It was, it was a lot of people actually. Uh, to this day, I, I know that uh, um, Geoffrey Donaldson um, complained about the, the Labour Party conference in Britain using the North of Ireland. Um, but I, I, I was seeing the, the criticism of DUP actually of constantly calling Ulster um, and referring to Ulster and, and, and not recognising that of the three counties of Ulster aren't in Northern Ireland. So this, this was always a the big issue for uh, Ulster unionists um, from the six counties, six county unionists, after Northern Ireland was created, like what did they call the state? They, they wanted to call it Ulster, um, but they 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 um, didn't in the end. Um, and this is going on for, for a couple of decades afterwards because they, they saw themselves as Ulster unionists. Um, they never saw themselves as Northern Ireland unionists. Like the whole idea of Northern Ireland is a new concept, and nobody had asked for it. And it, it became like this idea of a Northern Ireland identity really only comes in, you know, um, becomes acceptable, I suppose, and recognisable from the seventies onwards, really. And particularly later than that, um, at the time, you know, you were an Ulster Unionist, you were never Northern Ireland Unionist. That, that's why it was kind of used a lot, even though, uh, as, you, as you correctly say, it was, uh, um, it, Northern Ireland was never all of Ulster. And uh, it was a bone of contention for nationalists, clearly, not just from the three counties, but from, uh, from all over Ireland. So Peter asks, could it not just as easily be said that 1798 brought about the Act of Union, great and serious sectarian division and fear reflected by the growth of the Orange Order? Finally, of course, the partition of the island, as reflected later by nationalist and Republican behaviour, broadly thinking the North will come in eventually. Well, obviously, like uh, events happen under Constance Goodham, and you know, they're, they're, but like the Act of Union was created by the British government, and then uh, um, um, and Grattan Par Grattan's Parliament being compelled to, to go along with it. So you can't, you can't go. Of course, seventeen ninety eight happened. That that was the only reason for the Act of Union. There are so many other reasons that that led to, um, um, you know the the various different actions taken by the British government. You know, the British government were the ones who brought in the Act of Union. Um, and so, so what was the other part of the question there? Uh, so great and serious sectarian division reflected by the growth of the Orange Order. Finally, of course, the partition of the island as reflected later by nationalist and Republican behavior, broadly thinking the North would come in eventually. But is that a common that's what the that's, party that's that's the second part of the same question. Yeah, I'm not sure how it connects to 1798. Um, um, so, so this Peter is saying that uh, that the Nash's Republican behaviour is responsible for the North. Being yeah, created. and I think in that they assumed the North would just join. The yeah, but they, 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 later they, time. I think they did assume that you know once Britain left that, uh, um, <clears throat> that they would they would come in. Um, that was that was I I believe obviously totally naive and, uh, um, um, but look yeah, there, look there's there so many things at play here. Um, I, 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 again, it, it doesn't come down to one event. Um, I've always said this, that that decade from 1910 onwards counted for a great deal. And the solution, if you want to call it that, that, that arose from, from uh, you know, with, with partition of Ireland, which um, um, parts of Ulster having its own devolved government, that was never certain. It was never on the table even in, in, in those early years. So like a lot happened, a lot, a lot of um, um, different solutions could have happened. Um, you know, there's so many factors at play here at this time. So we can't discount what all the events that happened around this time. Um, I, I wrote an article for, uh, for the Irish News uh, last month, um, or sorry, this month, saying that uh, look played a big part of it. You know, everything played into the uh, unionist ha um, 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 ha cards or hands by by uh, that decade. Um, um, but there's also you know the, the British government's role, the nationalist role, the unionist role. A lot of could have changed over that period. Another anonymous attendee asks, do you think Carson used the Orange Order to his own purposes? Yeah, I do actually. I think I think uh, people use this a lot, defending Carson, saying that you know he wasn't anti partitionist, he was forced to by being a prisoner of Ulster Unionism. It just doesn't stack up with he's who Carson was. Carson wasn't a prisoner to anyone, he was his own man. And he he quite quickly and readily, you know, broke alliances uh, and became bitter against uh, um, um, former friends very quickly you know so I, I I just don't see any evidence to think that um that that Carson didn't do what he wanted when he wanted uh, at every given opportunity like that's, that's the way Carson was you know he was a he was a you know he, he was very proud of who he was um and uh he he was his own man and I, I just believe he personally believed that best solution he could get was six counties for Ulster and he he wanted that um so so he, the orange order were very happy with him obviously because he, he became a great champion for them um, and uh, but but he he also his uh, stock rose and you know he, he actually 
in many ways was was you know one of the most powerful figures in British political circles during that whole whole whole, whole rule crisis. Um, and you know he pretty much had Boner Law in his pocket. You know, and he, he, the, the the Liberal Party very uncertain about what's going to do. Um, and and he was given that kind of power because of the backing of the Orange Order, the backing of the Ulster Unionists. Um, so yeah, I, I think he benefited from that, their support as well. Uh, MPPS asks, is this militancy a precursor of Ian Paisley's? Absolutely, yeah. And Ian Paisley was a huge fan of Carson. I think he even had his blackthorn stick. I think, yeah. And I think he's, did he have his table as well? Where the he certainly had something to do with the uh, some league and covenant to do with Carson. Like Carson, uh, Paisley was a huge fan of Carson. So yeah, absolutely. I would say uh, Paisley's uh, militancy was certainly. Uh, um, got inspiration from Carson's language. And Marie asks, why was Carson allowed to get away with such treasonous rhetoric and actions? Well, if he wasn't going to get away with it, um, then you'd have to also have to convict the whole Conservative Party at the time. Um, if this wasn't just Carson who was committing treasonous uh, rhetoric and actions, it was actually supported fully by, uh, by the Conservative Party. Um, so that would have been a huge problem um, um, in Britain. And, and there was actually was a lot of support for by the British public from, you know, um, um, the Liberals didn't want to go to, to the polls um, on home rule. I think they, they would have decisively lost. So there was actually a lot of support within Britain for Carson's and Boner Law's actions on, um, on home rule. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think it, it would have been very difficult to convict, um, um, particularly with the support of the Conservative Party there. I think that that's uh, made it almost impossible for a uh, for Liberal government to do anything. And they didn't want to either because a lot of them were very ambiguous about what to do about home rule. Churchill and, and Lloyd George were open to uh, some kind of exclusion methods from around 1912. Okay, I've got a question from Donald Denham. Would Carson and Churchill, Winston Churchill, have been close to acquaintances? Yeah, no, they were they were very good friends. Um, actually, they, they also share a similarity and both were considered turncoats. As I said, Carson changed from uh, you know, defending farmers and tenants to, uh, um, you know, Convicting farm tenants for the for landlords and uh, and the crown and Churchill himself became known as a turncoat. You know he was in the Conservative Party, then joined the Liberal Party, then rejoined the Conservative Party. So the two of them kind of were uh, um, were seen as similar in, in some respects. But they were close. They were certainly were close ten, um, friends. You know if if, uh, if you can describe Carson as having many good friends. Um, and uh, yeah, he um, they, they I think they were, they were close up to Carson's death. Okay, uh, we're coming up to the one hour mark now, Cormac. So, do you want to continue with some more questions? Or, yeah, I don't mind. Yeah, I don't yeah, mind. okay. So, M Chambers asks, why was, why was a four county solution not implemented or even more seriously considered? Well, Ulster Unions wanted the maximum area they could get while still maintaining, you know, um, <laughs> a, not a monopoly on power, to so to speak. So, they felt two thirds majority would give them the maximum area. Um, where they felt they can control um, for for a long time. And obviously, obviously, we know now that's uh, that that six county kind of uh, um, 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 you know um, location or, or area is, is is no longer secure for Ulster Unionists. Um, but that, that was the main reason behind it. Um, and you know, they, they, like some people said, it was too small. I personally think that four counties still would have worked from a financial point of view. And a lot of people say that you know. It wasn't viable. It would have been uneconomic. Most of the wealth in, in what it, what it is in Northern Ireland at the time came from Belfast and its hinterlands. So you know, there wasn't much wealth in kind of the Tyrone and Fermanagh anyway. So I, I don't know how they, they they wouldn't have survived without four counties. And they actually would have been more secure, and there would be more. Um, there would be actually less likelihood of of partition ending if there was four counties. Um, uh, you know, uh, they, they obviously felt six counties was was going to give them security for as long as they could think, and that's why they would have been for it. Hey, um, government not, to as well, like, and that's why look, I'm not going to get into it here. But the Boundary Commission could have, if it was framed properly, could have seen that kind of that six counties uh, jeopardized and actually changed. But because of the framing, six counties uh, remained uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so the British government, obviously, and, and even Sinn Fein's uh, um, um, mistake in agreeing to a very ambiguous Boundary Commission made sure that six counties survived. So Noel Roach says, uh, many thanks for the most interesting talk and asks, can you offer books on the topic? Can you elaborate on his support for a Catholic university? Yeah, well, I, well, I can offer my book, you know, I, I think Carson lost, Birth of the Border. Um, he, he does come up prominently and certainly in the early chapters of, of my book. Um, 
I think like Alvin Jackson has a really interesting uh, double biography of, of comparing ju judging Carson and Redmond. Um, I, I've been a really excellent. Uh, I think Alvin Jackson definitely would be the, the kind of expert. I, I would think on, on Carson's life in many respects. Um, you know, he, he's he's done some fabulous research on, on Carson's life and, and politics and so on. Um, so yeah, so they're, they're probably the two I would suggest. Um, but he he supported, like as I said, um, he, he wasn't as kind of. Uh, sectarian in nature as, as some other uh, Ulster Unionists and uh, he did support the Catholic University um, which, which, which became National University of Ireland in, in you know the, the late 1900s 1908 I believe um, he supported he, he, he believed that um, that Catholics should have their own university um, and uh, yeah so he, he fully supported that and that happened as well obviously with, with NUI being formed. Uh, Donald says excellent talk as ever thank you uh, we know the Irish American community had a major influence over nationalism in Ireland through funding and political activism. But was there any similar influence on un unionism from counterparts in North America? They tried, they just didn't have a success. Like, there definitely was, um, um, say, representatives from the different Protestant churches would have gone over to America and, and Ulster unions would have gone over um, um, a bit, but you just didn't have the success or the reach that the, uh, the Catholic Irish American community has. Um, and they just weren't as effective in in propaganda. Like no no one did propaganda pretty much as, as well as, as Sinn Fein did it. Um, and I think Sinn Fein obviously learned it from Parnell, from Douglas Hyde, you know, from from many other people, um, beforehand who used America very effectively in actually garnering support. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, many uh, there were a number of missions over from from different Protestant churches to to give the Ulster Unionist case. Um, and they they obviously got some funds, but uh, they just weren't as successful at it as as. Uh, Anymore. Christopher McDonald uh, asks, do you think abstention policy contributed to partition by Sinn Féin not being in Westminster to prevent or shape the Government of Ireland Act 1920? In a word, no, I don't. And the reason why I say this, but, and a lot of historians have said that if Sinn Féin were in Westminster, you know, they could have framed the Government of Ireland Act and changed it around. They, just the numbers didn't stack up. And it was a pure, it's always is a pure numbers game when, when it comes to uh, government decisions. So with the, the Westminster government, you had, so you had um, 73 uh, seats for Sinn Féin, which were 69 MPs, um, four of them were, had, had uh, elected in two constituencies. Um, you had uh, 29, I think, um, unionists, um, you had six uh, um, Irish party MPs, but then you had, you had the government itself of the, the Conservative Party and David Lloyd George's coalition liberals of over 500 people, you know, so it was just like an over 300 and I think it's about 337 or something were actually Conservative Party uh, um, MPs. So the numbers weren't there. No matter if 73 um, MPs could have made no difference on the, the framing of the Government of Ireland bill. Labour Party opposed it. The Liberal Party opposed it. They, they weren't listened to. Why would it? Why would the British government listen to them if the numbers didn't need them? It's the only time British governments have listened to Irish nationalists or or is it, and even unionists is when actually the votes depend on it, when, when actually there's a, um, they hold a balance of power. That didn't arise in 1918 with the huge majority that Lloyd George's government had. So I, I personally think it would have made not, not a jot of difference if Sinn Féin were in Westminster. We've got some comments here from Mary, uh, Roni de Bruyne, uh, Maria, all complimenting you on an excellent talk and on your book as well. Maria has read your book and says it's excellent. Great, thank uh, you. John, John Russell asks, what was the role of the churches in partition, especially the Church of Ireland? Yeah, they, they, like, I have a chapter on, on the, the, the role of the, the main uh, religions and how they were affected by partition um, in birth of the border. Um, yeah, like, it was difficult, like, depending where you are in Church of Ireland, if you're based in, in the six counties, there was, there was tend to be a lot of support for partition. Um, and the Church of Ireland never partitioned. None of the Protestant churches partitioned. They are all still all Ireland bodies. Um, and definitely would say that the and a lot of the, the infrastructure of those religions remained in Dublin, still remains in Dublin. Um, but you know, it depends, as I said, where they were. Um, um, the you know, obviously, if you're based in Dublin or the south of west of Ireland, um, it was very difficult. You know, um, the, the Methodist actually church had a particularly trying time because uh, Methodists uh, um, um, they ha they had to kind of change their area every three years. So they could be in, in Belfast one year, and three years later they could have been in Galway or Cork or you know, God knows where they would have been. So they have to be careful as well of what they said about it, um, depending on where they were or where they could end up. And so, so some, um, you know, didn't get involved. But then if you look at the Ulster um, Psalm League and Covenant, you know, the, the, the Protestant churches were very active in that, in, 
in in opposing home rule. Um, and uh, they, they didn't want to be in home rule and they accepted, like a lot of the Protestant churches accepted it, but there were some um, 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 kind of, uh, um, um, you know, uh, vicars and, uh, and, and members of the hierarchy who actually opposed partition as well. So it really depending on the geography in many respects as well of where uh, certain representatives of those churches were based. There's uh, just a comment from Peter referring back to his earlier question about 1798 that he was making the point that uh, a lot of what happened after 98 can be seen as a result or can be traced back to the actions of 98. And then I think a, uh, a lot happened after 98 as well that caused a lot of uh, things to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stephen asks, I, I, I don't know if I've read this question yeah, before. Yeah, I, I, I honestly but, don't, know. I don't see any evidence of him speaking Irish. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that seems to be the end of the questions. So uh, at this point, uh, I just want to thank uh, Cormac uh, very much for his interesting talk.